atoms have existed for a long time and some understanding uh, that matter consists of atoms uh, was uh, already present all through the 19th century. And late in the 19th century, there began to be some indications that atoms could be broken up. The electron was discovered. It's a negatively charged and rather light particle. The electron was around for a decade or two, and a certain number of radioactive particles. Uh, uh, these were given out by uh, uh, radioactive nuclei, which are only the very heaviest nuclei. Uh, they tend to give off uh, uh, occasionally electrons, but uh, also a heavier, a much heavier sort of positively charged particle, which were called, these were called alpha particles. And we know nowadays that those are, in fact, the nuclei of helium atoms. They may never have lived in a helium atom, but uh, they come out of nuclei and they, uh, they're uh, good candidates for the nuclei of uh, of helium atoms. The notion that there are, uh, uh, that these radioactively emitted particles could be used as projectiles to investigate what goes on in matter occurred to uh, a chap we have known for uh, a hundred years or so as, as, as Lord Rutherford. Uh, he was a young New Zealander. I, uh, New Zealand, I was there recently, was very proud of him. Uh, he had the happy notion of using alpha particles as projectiles and sending them through thin gold films to see how much uh, they are deflected by the matter within the gold film. And he discovered to his amazement that these gold films consisted mostly of empty space and there had to be more or less uh, point-sized positive particles that repelled, that repelled those alpha particles. And by <clears throat> looking carefully at the angular distribution of scattered alpha particles, he determined that atoms were mostly empty space with a, with a massive nucleus at the center. So our whole picture of what the atom is really like inside uh, comes from around the turn of the 20th century. And it has developed, of course, a fair amount since then. Uh, once we knew that these nuclei were present and that we could invest investigate them by uh, scattering charged particles from them, uh, that became a, a very active game in the 1920s and 1930s. Particle accelerators were built in order to project charged particles at uh, nuclei, and it was discovered that in fact uh, the nuclei were not just points, they had a size which was measured with greater and greater accuracy and which we know these days to be something like a uh, hundred thousand times smaller than the diameter of the atom. The atoms consist mostly of empty space with electrons floating around in orbits around the nuclei and uh, these uh, nuclei could be broken up to some degree by the projectiles that these accelerators would fling at them. And uh, that became really the only means we had for investigating these very short-range forces that hold the particles of the nuclei together and that represent the interactions between these uh, projectile particles and the nuclei. That sort of thing was very systematically investigated in the 20s and 30s and uh, 
many of these things were well established. Of course, one of the big surprises, maybe the biggest su single surprise, since nuclei were known to be very tightly bound together, was after the discovery of a neutral particle. When I was in high school, we were taught that there were electrons in the nucleus necessary in order to neutralize a uh, huge positive charge for the particles. And uh, that was, in spite of its looking like nonsense and, and, and being nonsense, and the resolution of that nonsense was the discovery that the nuclei contain neutral particles as well as positive particles. And uh, these neutral particles, or neutrons, can penetrate nuclei with no problems at all. They can uh, inspire nuclear reactions very easily. And Enrico Fermi, who I once worked with, uh, was the most active investigator of these things, and he found all kinds of remarkable properties uh, that were revealed by having neutrons absorbed in nuclei. One of the most remarkable, surely the most remarkable of them, he never at that stage understood well enough, uh, that was when neutrons were allowed to fall on the heavier elements, and in particular uranium, all kinds of different radioactivities were inspired. He thought he was discovering transuranic elements, elements heavier than uranium. And in one sense he was right, but in another sense he missed the boat completely. Well, he was awarded the Nobel Prize and used the occasion to escape from uh, Italy with his wife. And he came to America, Columbia University in New York, and uh, it wasn't until this sort of thing was investigated much more deeply by Otto Hahn, a German, who found remarkable properties of these radioactivities. What Hahn found was that the lifetimes of many of these things corresponded to elements that he was already familiar with, nuclei he was familiar with, which were only in the middle of the atomic table. It made not a great deal of sense, this, this particular collection of coincidences. So he decided to follow the chemistry of these things. And the chemistry is something you can follow uh, remarkably well, just a few atoms at a time, because they're radioactive. They always tell you where they're going. They're tagged, in a sense. So this remarkable chemistry persuaded him that these elements produced by shooting neutrons at the heaviest element were in fact about half as heavy as the element uranium. And that made to him no sense at all. The problem was solved by a former uh, assistant of his who had had to flee Germany and was in Stockholm, a woman, Lisa Meitner, uh, who with her nephew, whom I knew well, uh, Otto Frisch, concluded that what was happening was that the uh, nucleus of uranium was being split in half. And uh, Niels Bohr, who was told about this, immediately found this, agreed with the theory of his, that uh, the surface of a nucleus is rather like the surface of a bubble and it can be set into violent motion by the release of this kind of energy within the nucleus and that what was happening was these uranium nuclei were breaking in half and if so, they, uh, the two halves would have more neutrons than corresponded 
to nuclei of that amount of charge. So they would have to give off neutrons. And then the idea occurred immediately to several people uh, that maybe a chain reaction could be uh, produced, the chain reaction in, in which you send in one neutron, the nucleus splits in half, more neutrons are given out, and those neutrons inspire the fission, as it was called, of other uranium nuclei, and you would have, indeed, a chain reaction. Uh, that, was, that realization just happened to be in 1939, and uh, it was a very dramatic one. I remember it was, uh, the war began on my 14th birthday. And once we were in the war, there was the question, is it possible, would there be any sense in creating a chain reaction uh, for uh, any military purpose? None was clear. Uh, the British started working on this immediately. Uh, the Americans were, I would have to say, very slow off the mark. Uh, and uh, it was so slow in America that when finally we did succeed in doing all of this and actually making a weapon of it, the war had been over for two years, for two months, I'm sorry. Uh, and uh, we, we missed the boat completely. Now, I mention all of this because I was in college uh, at the time uh, uh, when I was, they, they used to skip kids in, in school in those days. And uh, I was just beginning at that point in uh, 1941, it was. I was just uh, beginning my studies of physics. But uh, uh, everything started to converge very quickly. The university, this university, Harvard, announced they were giving most of their courses, uh, the advanced ones and certainly the intermediate ones, for the last time. I skipped all of those, took the advanced courses. And uh, by the time I was at my 18th birthday, <laughs> I had had enough of the graduate education that they uh, came here and, and asked me to go out west and join a new project which was starting. And there was a great mystery of what in the world was going on in that project. It was kept as secret as they could make it. Uh, I had found out by snooping around all sorts of things, and two-thirds of them were completely wrong. Uh, but, <laughs> but when I got out there uh, and was cleared uh, by the security people, uh, the guy who ran the experimental division asked me what, from what I had been able to find out, what they might be working on. He just wanted to see what sort of thing one could pick up uh, by rumor. And uh, I told him I thought they were trying to start the chain reaction. And he chuckled and said, well, <laughs> that was about 14 months ago <laughs> we did that. We're trying now to make an explosion, a bomb. And I must say, I was terribly shocked and disappointed by that. But uh, the danger that we might be subject to, because the Germans appeared to know precisely what we knew, the danger was considerable enough, and the whole project interesting enough, that one really got involved in it. And I did work there for the next two years as a theorist, they wouldn't let me near the experimental detonation. I had to look from a mountaintop about a hundred miles off Sandia Peak, and uh, it was quite a spectacular conclusion to that time. 
Well, the business of investigating collisions of accelerated particles, that is charged particles, uh, with nuclei continued in a much bigger way in the years after the Second World War. Uh, before that time, uh, highly energetic particles were not really available. They would require accelerators that were too large. Uh, so it was only at the, uh, in the years 1947 and 48 that accelerators became available that went up to 100 million volts per particle. 100 million volts was not even a high enough energy to do anything more than break up a nucleus. There was a great deal of that that was investigated. But it was discovered <clears throat> that when you got up above about three or 400 million volts, you began to generate altogether new particles. And these were particles which were like quanta of the nuclear field, and some of them responsible actually for holding the nucleus together, or so it appeared. But then, uh, inevitably, we developed higher and higher energy accelerators. And as those were developed, altogether new families of particles appeared. And these families of particles became eventually pretty standardized, but they're a strange bunch, which we have no familiarity with from in everyday terms. They were always called in those days strange particles. Uh, you don't hear that term very much anymore. You, you hear uh, all of these classifications of particles called the standard model. But uh, strange they were, and we had never seen anything of that sort before. And it's the investigation of those particles that has taught us most of what we know uh, about the interactions of elementary particles. But I dare say we have an awful lot still to learn in that area. <laughs>